to CSIS. My name is Andrew Cutchins, and I'm director of the Russia and Eurasia program here. And it's a great pleasure uh, to welcome uh, Fyodor Lukyanov today, who will be speaking on the very timely topic with Russian elections coming up on Sunday and a new president uh, inaugurated in May. The end of the post-Soviet period in Russian foreign policy, what is next? Uh, this lecture today is the second in a series of talks sponsored by the Russian Balance Sheet Project, which is a collaboration between the, uh, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, the Peterson Institute for International Economics, and the New Economic School in Moscow. Uh, and more personally, with uh, Sergei Guryev at the New Economic School, Anders Oslin at the Peterson in Institute, and myself uh, co-directing the project. I want to take a moment to thank uh, the sponsors for the project, which include Microsoft, Coca-Cola, Chevron, Caterpillar, and I'd like to give special thanks to Alcoa, uh, who provided funding uh, especially to make this speaker series possible. Fyodor Lukyanov, our speaker today, is the editor-in-chief, founding editor-in-chief of Russian Global Affairs, uh, Russia's most prestigious uh, international affairs journal, which has a uh, collaborative relationship with foreign affairs here. It was founded in 2002, and he has made enormous contributions to this journal, making it Russia's most authoritative source of expert opinion on Russian foreign policy and global issues. He has an extensive background in different Russian and international media, where he worked from 1990 to 2002. And as a commentator in international affairs, he often contributes to various media in the United States, <coughs> Europe, and China. Indeed, uh, Fyodor is uh, one of Russia's most insightful, authoritative, uh, and prolific, uh, I would say, commentators and writers, not only on Russian foreign policy, but on international affairs uh, more generally. And in fact, uh, some of you probably saw that one of his articles uh, recently published, I think, in RIA Novosti, was republished in the Russia Now version uh, of the Washington Post today. Uh, Fyodor is also a member of the Presidium of the Council on Foreign and Defense Policy, an independent organization providing foreign policy expertise uh, in Moscow and around the world. And he's a member of the Presidential Council on Human Rights and Civic Society Institutions. And he holds a degree in Germanic languages from Moscow State University. So, the topic again today is extremely timely, and uh, Fyodor, I'm delighted to welcome you here to, uh, to Washington. So let me turn the podium over to you. Thank you very much, Andy. Uh, thank you all who came to this event. It's a big honor and big uh, uh, pleasure to me for me to be here because uh, Timing is really exceptional. The, the, I, <laughs> frankly, when, when we discussed uh, this uh, uh, event, my, my visit to Washington to CSIS, I didn't realize that, that I will uh, be here just three days or two days before elections. And uh, I, I uh, got, got it here, so this, this understanding. And, uh, of course, this election is uh, much more interesting uh, uh, than previous ones, uh, not because of result, which we more or less know already, but the atmosphere is different, uh, the mood of society is different, and uh, change is expected, not immediately after election, uh, but uh, certainly in, in months and years to come, because Russia is at a again, unfortunately we need to say it again and again, at the crossroad, and uh, we will need to choose path for the future. Uh, and next president, who, whose name we will learn on Monday, uh, will face enormous task to actually to re revisit, to redefine Russian identity, political identity in world affairs. Uh, for various reasons, which I try to address. Also, it's very interesting to be here these days because uh, being uh, very much jet-lagged and uh, uh, waking up uh, half past four or five in the morning, I watch American television 
and I follow with great interest the current primary uh, battle between uh, Santorum and Romney, and that's, that's very interesting to compare how political machines are uh, working here and, and in Russia, especially <laughs> given that fact that many uh, events organized now by Vladimir Putin's campaign, uh, which are, many of them are rather anti-American in, in substance, but the form is entirely American. And he, uh, for example, yesterday's, or two days, it, it was on a Thursday, today's gathering of Putin's supporters and his speech was staged exactly as an American election convention. So it's, it's, it's as, as a replica. So it's another, another interesting uh, detail about our love and hate relationship. So uh, Vladimir Putin helped me very much uh, uh, to prepare this introduction because uh, his uh, last article, last article in series of pre-election uh, pre uh, statements was published on Monday in Moskovsky Novosti newspaper and it was just dedicated to uh, foreign policy. Uh, this article, uh, contained no sensations, but I think it was extremely interesting uh, in, in a way that, that we can understand Putin's worldview from, from, from this, this text. Uh, according to Putin, contemporary world is unpredictable, complicated, and dangerous in many, many ways. Uh, ways. Starting from, uh, as he put it, unpatient bellicosity everywhere and erosion of international institutions, international law, and finishing with uh, a new notion which he introduced in this article, illegal soft power, uh, which is used by uh, different countries, in particular by this country, to undermine society, stability in societies uh, by means of funding uh, NGOs, funding uh, different organizations uh, in working against stability in Russia and in other countries. So the main, uh, the main message from this article, which some colleagues compared to Munich speech five years ago, and Munich speech was exactly five years ago in February 2007, but, uh, and, and some people re read uh, uh, the anti-American, anti-Western sentiments in this article, like in, in Munich speech. In my understanding, it's not a fair comparison. Uh, this article is, is completely different because Munich speech was very energetic, uh, sometimes even aggressive in criticizing the West for uh, its failure to uh, build equal and uh, fruitful relationship with Russia. This article is completely different, of completely different mood. It's rather uh, defensive. And the main message, we need to protect our country for numerous challenges and threats coming from the outside. Uh, this is no an energy for expansion. Uh, there is rather concern. Putin is really worried about what is going on in world affairs and what is happening uh, around Russia and which impact it, it can have on Russia. Uh, how Russia should do, what, what Russia should do to survive in this, in this world. First of all, and this is uh, I think a very important statement by Putin, not in this final article, but rather in the first one published uh, in January in Izvestia. Russia should stop to look backwards all the time. Uh, he said in, in his first article, the post-Soviet era is over and the post-Soviet agenda has been completely exhausted. And I think it, it is really very important statement, very, very uh, correct and right statement, uh, which give, gives me and gives many of uh, readers of this article uh, 
a hope that we can expect something new in years to come. What means post-Soviet agenda? Since collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, this event, which is identified and described by maybe majority of Russian people as, as a tragic event, as a, as a misfortune event, uh, served as a reference point for any political activities. Uh, if we try to generalize, which is very difficult to generalize whole period between 1991 and approximately late uh, to, uh, 2000, uh, we had very different presidents, Yeltsin, Putin, and Medvedev. Uh, we had different policies, but looking in general terms, the aim was the same, both for Yeltsin, Putin, and Medvedev. To prove to the outside world, first of all to the United States and Europe, as winners in, in the Cold War, to prove that collapse of the Soviet Union did not mean Russian disappearance from global stage as, as, a, as an actor, as a player. Uh, different presidents tried to do it by different means. Uh, Yeltsin had one kind of leverage, Putin another kind of leverage, and Putin was very different during his uh, eight years as president, his first uh, and second presidency, uh, but the aim was the same. And this aim was more or less reached uh, by the end of 2000s. And uh, in psychological terms, events, tragic events in August 2008, Russian-Georgian war, uh, was a culmination of this agenda. I put aside all moral aspects of this, this uh, disaster, but in terms of psychological, uh, uh, in terms of psychology of Russian society, of Russian establishment, it was uh, the first time since, uh, since late Gorbachev when Russia stopped to, to retreat, when Russia said no. And said basically if we say this is a red line so you should understand that this is a real red line and psychologically it was very important it was seen as 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 a success uh, it was war not with georgia in psychological terms but of course it was a war with the united states uh, anyway by after short euphoria which came realization started to emerge that to say in Barack Obama's word, yes, we can, but actually this is all we can. And that was not, not the beginning of new Russian expansionism, as many feared uh, uh, in those days, but rather the end. And since that, Russia started to gradually move to the new understanding of uh, international role, its own international role, and Medvedev's period after August 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, it was a period of uh, uh, regionalization of ambitions, to say it, to, to put it in this way. Uh, Russia started to, to uh, identify zone of privileged interest, as Medvedev put it in August 2008, but at that time it was perceived as a threat. But looking back, we understand that it was rather, rather the opposite. So he, 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 for the first time, actually said that, yes, we have privileged interests, but they are limited. They are not global as Soviet Union. Soviet Union had no sphere of in interest. He had the whole globe, and he tried to get it all. Uh, so uh, since that, uh, we... we, we so several signs of this rebalancing and re-identification uh, of, of interests. Uh, the one of examples for is that uh, 2010, uh, when uh, uh, bloodshed in Kyrgyzstan started, 
So everybody expected Russia to intervene. And everybody even wanted, or many even wanted Russia to intervene, but Russia didn't. Should it happen two, three years before, I'm almost sure that Russia would intervene to show that it's still a major player there. But 2010, it was another mood, and it was uh, quite a rational consideration, what can we do to stop it? The conclusion was we cannot do much, and so then it's not worth to take risks. So we can, if, if, if we analyze Russian policy since uh, 2008, we can find several signs of this, this kind of, uh, mm, this kind of uh, uh, re revisiting. Uh, by the way, in his last article, Putin didn't, didn't mention the Cold War, which is unusual because he and many Russian uh, officials used to do it almost all the time and th that was part of this post-Soviet agenda that Cold War, after Cold War, it was such an, such an important psychological event, such, such a big trauma that, that statements came back to that again and again. Uh, he doesn't, uh, doesn't mention that in, in, in this article and I think it's, it's also quite, quite an important, important step by the way, uh, it's also uh, a reason to start to think what are real differences between Russia and the United States because until now we, uh, we uh, used to blame a lot of problems on the legacy of the Cold War. It's inertia, mental, we're stuck in, in old confrontation and so on which is partly true because many people still live in old stereotypes, but I'm afraid that the situation is actually more complicated, that now we, we can see new kind of misunderstanding to emerge, not because of the Cold War rivalry, but because of completely different conceptual views on how the world looks like and how it should look like uh, to be stable and to be, uh, to be uh, secure. Uh, Putin's Russia, to, uh, uh, to judge from his article, is very much disappointed in the West. But disappointed in a different way than, than it was uh, five years ago. At that time, again, it was much more about irritation that you don't want to treat us seriously and you don't treat us in, in, in equally, as, as equal partners, as, as, as serious partners. Now it's, uh, it's different. Now he basically says that, yeah, the West is quite important in world affairs. West is trying to impose its own uh, models and uh, uh, ideas on, on the whole world. But it fails everywhere. So look, the results. Uh, Western policy uh, is inefficient and short-sighted without any, uh, any ability to seriously analyze what is happening. Uh, it's a lot of ideology and very, very insufficiently uh, of analysis. So every, looking at all major international problems starting from Arab Spring and to Iran or North Korea, Putin basically uh, comes to conclusion that it doesn't work. What you propose, it doesn't work. Uh, this interesting uh, uh, detail which uh, could be seen even before but is repeated again in his article, Putin sees uh, international development as a comprehensive one. Uh, each move will have inevitable, unavoidable uh, consequences, which is the trivial, trivial uh, idea, of course, but it looks sometimes that, that, that some moves by NATO, by US, by, by many international actors, uh, 
are not calculated in this way. So there is a feeling that somebody is trying to, to say, okay, we, we do it and, and it's isolated from the rest. So it's, it's okay with this case, but then we look what, what, we'll, what, what we'll do with other things. And Putin's, uh, Putin's view is a more classical that everything is interconnected and if you, if you destroy dictatorship, uh, secular dictatorship in one country, then you will get uh, Islamic uh, rise and uh, renaissance in, in many other countries, so something like this. Uh, Putin's view on world affairs is very classical. So the centerpiece of international systems should be a sovereign state. Uh, sovereignty is untouchable. It should be structural element of international system. And there is no other principle, no other idea, no other element which could replace sovereignty and sovereign state as this key uh, core element. So to elaborate on this and to, to, to try to, to find his conceptual difference from many others, Putin believes in classical principles and he doesn't believe in values. He thinks that uh, the so-called value-based policy, politics, means actually that you, you manipulate with some words and notions uh, and apply it in, in an absolutely uh, free way uh, based on current interest in each particular case. Then the important thing uh, about Putin, and this is a, a difference uh, to Medvedev's uh, time as president, uh, it seems that Putin still believes that, that Russia, is a global pow uh, Russia should remain a global power, not necessarily to uh, try to expand at different uh, parts of the world, but play across the whole field in order to secure secure interest in, in, in a particular part, in, in this sphere of privileged interest. But, but Russia should not isolate itself from games and from battles around in, in other parts of the world. So there is a global status which is needed not for expansion, not for expansionism, but rather for keeping status quo, for not, not degrade, not to, to retreat more. And here Putin uh, sees Russia as, not as a systemic opponent to the United States, as many, many think, but as, as a guarantor of, of, a, of a certain setup of, of views, setup of principles, the classical ones with sovereignty, with uh, strategic independence of great powers, with uh, belief in balance of powers, and he uh, identifies those whom he see uh, allies, not allies, but those who share same views, same values, if, if, if we say it. Uh, there are BRICS countries like China, like India, those who also believe in sovereignty and balance of power. Putin is absolutely sure that Russia is a target for uh, unfriendly uh, impact, unfriendly influence. Starting from military challenges, missile defense, uh, NATO enlargement, uh, till uh, attempts to impose some, such, some kind of uh, social social and political system uh, through, uh, through social media, media and, as, as he put it, the illegal soft power. So generally, the world is extremely hostile and uh, risky. So to be sure Russia needs strength, so it, it can only rely on its own strength and only in this uh, case Russia will be respected and will be treated in, 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 in an equal way. So which is important for the future is that Putin after three and a half years uh, as Prime Minister when he did not uh, 
uh, deal with foreign policy on a daily basis, but he is still extremely suspicious vis-à-vis -vis the United States. The uh, feelings accumulated during his presidency, 2000 to 2008, is still there. Nothing changed. He still cannot digest what he uh, what he considers as absolutely unfair behavior of Bush administration. And his anti-Americanism in this regard is product not of his past, as many, many, many uh, uh, journalists used to say that as, as former KGB and so. But in fact, he uh, started in early 2000s as, as a very much pro-Western and pro-American president. He wanted to, to, to uh, approach United States, he offered different ideas, he helped Americans in Central Asia after 9-11 in Afghanistan. He closed down two quite important, symbolically important facilities, military facilities, one in Vietnam, a military base and raider, uh, raider in Cuba, which nobody uh, recalls now. So it's perceived, it was perceived by Americans as, as something okay, of course, but for granted. Uh, by the way, he, he would never do it today. So <laughs> he, he would maybe invest more money in this radar station in Cuba. Uh, and he expected that American side, Bush administration, would uh, reciprocate in, in, in a similar way, that, that it will be increased strategic confidence, strategic trust between two countries, different kinds of uh, interaction. Uh, what did he get in return, at least from his point of view, aggressive uh, intervention of American interest in the post-Soviet area, which Russia always believed was very important, delicate uh, sphere for Russian interests. Uh, Georgia, Ukraine, Kyrgyzstan, uh, human rights uh, campaign, democracy promotion campaign, missile defense site in Poland, the Czech Republic. So in Putin's perspective, that was Bush's response to what Russia did uh, 2001, 2002 uh, to help Americans in, in, in that very difficult situation they um, found themselves. Uh, so I'm afraid that there is no chance to expect that relationship between Russia and America will be easy. More than that, after all passions uh, will be completed here in US and, and, and there in Russia, and new administrations will uh, take uh, their seats. Unfortunately, the only thing we will have immediately on our bilateral agenda is missile defense. And there is absolutely no chance to bypass it. So Russian side, both Putin and Medvedev, emphasized many times that do not expect that we will forget about that. This is a principal thing for Russian side. Uh, as long as we don't have any other principle of strategic stability than mutually assured destruction, and unfortunately we don't, uh, there is no way to, to ignore missile defense plans, even if there is a very uh, uh, distant and not very likely uh, uh, prospect of building that. But uh, Putin personally is very um, involved in this issue. And in his article, he once again reminded about uh, proposals given to George Bush administration in Kennebunkport 2007 and the reaction which was known uh, by Bush administration and so on. So I'm afraid that uh, we will need some, some serious reshuffle of our relationship uh, in order to, to get a new agenda. Otherwise we will stuck in, in this missile defense completely and that will define our relationship in years to come. Uh, Despite all this, Putin many times uh, uh, stressed that Russia is an open country, 
which is ready to economically interact, deeply economically interact with everybody, with uh, all partners. And uh, in his uh, recent article, he passionately defended Russian membership in WTO, which, uh, as you maybe know, is not at all a popular option in Russia. It was a rather controversial decision by, by the government to join. Uh, and another interesting uh, detail of this spirit of openness which Putin uh, displayed was uh, one of previous articles dedicated to security and military issues where he, uh, where he wrote that actually to buy arms uh, in other countries abroad is, is a normal thing. And this is, in a way, a revolution, because, because the traditional Russian approach is that, no, it's, it should be self-sufficient. It should be totally uh, self-productive uh, uh, um, uh, area. So uh, to outline uh, some contours of, of Russian, Russian foreign policy in years to come, we need to, uh, to refer to, to three big, uh, uh, three big uh, highlight, uh, hi um, highlights, uh, global development which will have impact on, on Russia, on Russian positioning. First, there is an obvious decline of the European Union as a political force. And that will have quite a serious impact both on Russian-European relationship and on development inside Russia and in uh, many of neighboring countries. Because the European choice, the hypothetical uh, integration into European system, European structures, uh, has always been an important part of political debate, even in Russia, despite the fact that Russia never considered seriously to join the European Union, but especially in neighboring countries like Ukraine, Moldova, and that was actually in Ukraine, it was, it was uh, the main, uh, uh, the core of whole uh, debate since uh, uh, Kuchma or since even Kravchuk time. So now the disappearance of the European Union as a significant political player and deep crisis of, uh, conceptual crisis of European integration uh, will change uh, this, and it's quite difficult to understand how those countries will position themselves if they understand that European choice is not available anymore. European choice in, in form of membership in, in the European Union is not available anymore. For Russia, it's uh, quite a problematic because uh, abstract European model uh, used to play an important role in shaping internal debate as, as a symbol of progress, symbol of success. And now it's quite difficult to refer to Europe as a, as, as a, as, as a model for successful development. So I think that, that uh, uh, development in the European Union will, will have major impact on Russia. Maybe new Europe, more national, less integrated, uh, will mean new opportunities for Russian Federation because Russia always uh, wanted to strike deals, bilateral deals with particular countries, and now it seems that the whole development inside the European Union is rather towards this uh, model. Second process which uh, trend, which will have major impact, huge impact on Russia, there is rise of Asia, shift of global focus from Euro-Atlantic to Asia-Pacific. Russia will need to find completely new approach, new strategy, new comprehensive strategy in Asia. So far it, it doesn't exist. And it's quite a symbolic coincidence that Putin's first visit after his announcement to about comeback was to Beijing. It was a coincidence of course, but, but very symbolic one. And I, I personally think that in his six years as president, China, issue of China will be number one for, for him. Uh, and I hope even that it might start to gradually change uh, prism through which we, I mean Russia and America, 
uh, look at each other because in Asia, unlike Europe, in Asia we have more in common and from different angles, but Moscow and Washington are facing same problems. Nobody knows how to deal with China now and especially how to deal with China in five years' time, ten years' time, if China continues to develop in, 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 in a way as, as now. And uh, third, uh, there is uh, a change of approach vis-a-vis -vis neighboring countries. I uh, touched upon that uh, before. Uh, Russian obsession with the uh, imitation of re-establishing re of Soviet Union, or, or not Soviet Union, but, but something around Russia, which was uh, quite an important part of agenda in 1990s and in 2000s. Now it, uh, it changes and uh, uh, Russia is trying to formulate a new approach which is much more pragmatic, much more economy-based. And there is an attempt, I mean the customs union or now it, it is called Eurasian Union, there is not an attempt to restore Soviet Union. It's just the opposite. It's an attempt for the first time, uh, by the way, to uh, invite partners, neighboring countries, some of neighboring countries, by the way, not all of them, to uh, participate in, in, in a structure which can be mutually beneficial for all. And this is not about Soviet Union. This is just about the economy, to expand markets, to try to restore those production chains which were d broken by collapse of the Soviet Union. And I would rather say that it is th this is an attempt to launch something like a European integration 60 years ago. I mean conceptually. No guarantee that it will, it will be successful, but, but at least it's the first attempt to be serious about that and not just imitate that all, all neighboring countries want uh, to, be, to have Russia as a, as a patron. Uh, the main challenge to Putin, or okay, to the next president, uh, <laughs> will be that he will chair a situation which he cannot uh, fully control. Uh, Russia is extremely vulnerable. <coughs> what will happen in, in the European Union? That will have tremendous impact on Russia, on the Russian economy. Will U.S. government be able to deal with the federal debt and, and uh, improve economic situation? That's also very important for the general uh, oil and gas conjuncture and, and for Russia. Whether China will be able to keep the sufficiently high level of economic growth, high rate of economic growth. What will happen in, in, the, European, in, uh, in the Middle East? with Iran, with Syria, with, with all countries, with Saudi Arabia, so who, who is no guarantee that in two, three years' time we, we, we will not be faced with some, some, something similar in Gulf states. All this is beyond Russian control, but all this will have tremendous impact on Russia. I think Putin is very much aware of this. And that's why I think that despite his rhetorics, despite his uh, passions and his emotions vis-a-vis -vis United States, despite his conceptual views, which some of them are, of course, about how to make Russia important player and play a bigger role, but his basic and uh, core principle in, in world affairs will be a medical one, do not harm. Do not do some, something which can uh, which can worsen situation or which can provoke some development which will be disastrous. Uh, additional problem for any Russian ruler, for any ruler uh, of unstable countries, countries with unstable democracy, there is that any internal turbulence will be resonate with external factors and can finally destroy any, any construction. construction. And this is, this is a very difficult dilemma for, for any ruler, what to do with social unrest, for example. 
if you try to to press it to to dissolve it you can arrive to enormous escalation because of external influence because of an internal if you try to ignore it to let it go then you can arrive to the same result and i think that that this line is very thin and and how to how to identify how to find it that's that's the biggest task for any um, um, any uh, president or prime minister, uh, especially in Russia, with uh, this enormous amount of unresolved problems. Uh, Putin is aware of that. I still belong to the minority of experts in Russia who think thought that Putin will not be <laughs> be back. Mistaken, but at least I still believe that that he didn't want to do it, and the decision to come back was a result of his considerations and his conclusion that without him it will be even even worse. So certain kind of disappointment in in the acting president. Uh, some of colleagues said after a historic announcement in September about this exchange that. Thanks God, now we have clarity for next 24 years in Russia. Tw 12 more years of Putin, then 12 more years of Medvedev, and its stability. Uh, quite several weeks after we saw that stability is not uh, that safe, and uh, it's absolutely uh, senseless to try to predict for such a long period. Uh, Anyway, this time, six years, which Putin will be serve as next president, most likely will do, uh, will not be time of final, uh, final uh, self-identification and finding of new way, new path for Russia. It's, ru it's just impossible because the whole world is collapsing, all institutions, all norms, and the only, the only way to to uh, conduct policy is just to react more or less efficiently to outside force, to outside impulses, and try to survive in, in more or less stable, uh, stable form. Uh, but this period is crucial because after that, I think by by the end of this decade, we will see some kind of clarity in world affairs, and uh, e almost everything will depend on in which form, in which condition Russia will arrive to this moment. And that means that Putin has enormous responsibility. He hopefully was aware of that when he decided to come back. And now we will see whether he will be fit for this job. Thank you. Well, Fyodor, when I was uh, inspired to invite you to speak in this series, it was actually when I heard your presentation at the, uh, in Kaluga at the Valdai Discussion Club conference in early November, and uh, you outlined uh, a foreign policy agenda for the next Russian president. And I thought that the presentation was so extraordinary in its uh, analytical depth and its comprehensive breadth uh, that you were the ideal person uh, to come here to Washington uh, to talk about that uh, in the context of our series looking at Russia's emerging futures. And you have certainly not disappointed us in the least bit with that last uh, pre presentation. Now, but like uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, you live in a world of risk. And we're going to now open the floor to questions and comments and open discussion with the video cameras running. And I, if I might, I would like to take the, uh, the prerogative of the chair to ask you the, the first question. It's kind of a two-pronged question. Um, uh, looking at the, what I think were the central motivations or amongst the central motivations for both the United States and Russia to undertake the rapprochement, the so-called reset uh, that began nearly, uh, well, began three years ago. I know for the Obama administration that the central concern driving them uh, to improve ties with Russia was concern the urgency of the Iranian nuclear, nuclear program. That was the number one priority. Probably the new, number two priority was uh, Af the Afghan war and expectations of increasing uh, 
a military footprint there and need for support from Russia in that regard. And I think the, the third priority was uh, a different vision for nuclear arms control, a uh, more traditional one, and the imminent expiration of the START, uh, START I treaty. Now, on Iran, um, this remains, I think, the central preoccupation for the Obama administration, uh, probably for ties with Russia and, 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 w and with others. I was struck in the, uh, in the speech, uh, or the, excuse me, the article, Russia's, uh, Russia in a Changing World, published two days ago in Moskovsky Novosti, that uh, Putin actually said very little about, about Iran, and it was quite, quite moderate. So I was wondering if you might uh, uh, express your views on what do you think would be the prospects for a further meeting of the minds between um, the Obama administration uh, and uh, a Putin administration on Iran, the possibility of further, further sanctions on Iran and or other uh, actions. On the reverse side, uh, and this is I don't know for a fact, but it's been one of my operating hypotheses, is that one of the things that motivated Russia uh, it gave Russia incentives for improving relations with the United States, was the perception that coming out of the, um, Putin always talked about the changing global balance of power in the world. That was a central theme of his Munich speech. Uh, and that these emerging powers were becoming more powerful and the West was declining. But that coming out of the global economic crisis that uh, uh, there was an acceleration of this shift and very much in the favor of China. And there is some concern that the unmitigated growth of power and influence of, of China was not, was the growth and influence of China was not necessarily an unmitigated good for Russia. And that it made sense for Russia to actually improve its ties with Washington to help to balance its overall foreign policy uh, portfolio, if you will. Now, in looking at, if I look at the speech, excuse me, the, the article published two days ago, um, Quite a bit said about China, very positive with very small caveats, although that there were caveats may be significant. Full shared vision with the Chinese leadership, highest level of trust uh, ever with the Chinese leadership. And strikingly, there was not one word said about Japan, um, a not insignificant country. And if I take if I were to just to look at that article, it would suggest to me that, in fact, well, it looks like Russia is, has decided to really bandwagon with Chinese power and to uh, not engage in balancing efforts with other powers uh, in Asia, including the United States and, and Japan. Uh, and I wonder what is your perspective on that? Yeah. That's an another another introduction for 45 minutes or so. <laughs> you have to give it. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of people in the audience. Yeah. So about Iran, uh, I think that uh, uh, any further uh, cooperation will be quite difficult because uh, Russian view on Iranian threat is different from American and Israeli view. Russia does not see Iran as such an unpredictable and crazy regime as many people do here or especially in, in Israel. Uh, sanctions on Iran 2010, it was part of package deal, actually. What was reset? Reset was a package deal. Americans uh, disliked this, this notion and, uh, and uh, never, never mentioned that, but in fact it was a package deal which involved several topics interconnected. And part of that was, was Iran because Russia understood and Medvedev and Putin understood that, as you said, for Obama administration it was maybe the most important uh, element of the whole reset. I don't see any uh, package deals in, in the foreseeable future between Russia and the United States, not because of quite a shaky uh, stance of relationship, but first of all because uh, I don't see topics which can be uh, interconnected and discussed in, 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 in this package. So I'm afraid that after what happened in Libya and after what is going, going on in Syria now, where Russia and the United States take 
diametrical positions, not only because of Russian arms contracts with Syria, as, as some people say here. Now it's not, 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 not uh, it doesn't matter anymore. It, it mattered in, it initially, but not anymore. Uh, it's a conceptual difference, how to deal with the international crisis. And I, I don't see a, a, a big uh, prospect for this kind of cooperation on Iran, uh, unless the uh, situation will change drastically and, uh, mm, um, yeah, for example, Iran will uh, openly demonstrate that, that it aspires and almost achieves this nuclear status. Uh, by the way, to talk about uh, reasons for Russia to uh, uh, be engaged in reset policy with Obama. I think the, the main one was not China. The main one was a uh, uh, desire to ease pressure, American pressure on the post-Soviet area. Because from Russian point of view, it was the main, the main, the main concern and the main uh, irritation in the Bush administration, that Bush administration especially at the, at the end of, of, of the mandate, decided to make, to, decided to complete a couple of important things, and all of them, both NATO enlargement to Georgia and Ukraine, and a third uh, uh, site, a new, a new uh, missile defense installations in Poland and Czech Republic, both uh, were in the area which Russia th uh, thought was very delicate and important. And uh, actually, after reset, we see that American activities in the post-Soviet area has been uh, much less than before. And this is what, what Russia thinks is a big achievement. As for China, uh, uh, in Hillary Clinton's article about U.S. strategy in Asia a couple of months ago, Russia wasn't mentioned at all which I think is, 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 a, is strange because, okay, Russia is not the, the, the most, uh, not the strongest uh, element in Asian po politics and Asian affairs, but it is a huge country, uh, mainly placed in Asia with uh, quite a big potential just to play this balancing role. So uh, I'm afraid that we still don't have any understanding, uh, I mean, both here and, and there, that uh, we will need to find a new configuration in Asia. And uh, for Russia, it's vitally important to have excellent relationship with China. But as Putin told at, at his recent meeting with political scientists, uh, he was very, very polite and, and constructive about China. But at the same time, he said, if you think, he, he answering uh, actually my, my question about Ch Russian-Chinese relationship, he, he was very positive. But at the same time, he said, if you think that we are blind and deaf and we, not see, and we don't see what they're doing, I mean, military buildup and economic might and so, you are wrong. So we see everything. So, of course, this for, for Putin, is an, uh, what, what I said in my introduction, I think that China issue will be maybe the most important one for Putin in years to come. Okay, thanks. Let's open the floor up. Please, uh, well, microphone will come around and uh, identify yourself. Hi, I'm Carol Bogert from Human Rights Watch. Uh, <laughs> hi. Uh, I have a question again. Last time we talked also about Syria. Yeah. <laughs> and. Uh, you mentioned the conceptual difference. Um, I, I really two questions. I mean, among foreign policy experts I know in Moscow, there is an increasing recognition that Russia has gotten into a dead end, but they seem to feel that in the Kremlin there is not a similar appreciation for where Russia has arrived in Syria, um, and where the Russian veto uh, on the UN resolution has has gotten, not just Russia, but you know Syria and the world. Um, is that your, what do you think is in Putin's mind about Syria? You mentioned that there is a conceptual difference with the West about it. And if I could ask further, the, in his article Putin, on foreign policy, Putin justifies the veto, as did Shurkin at the time and others, as an attempt to forestall civil war, or war, let's say, that uh, this resolution would lead, as with Libya, to international military intervention, and that was bad. 
But in fact, we are now in a state where civil war is increasingly inevitable, if not, in fact, going on right now. The Saudis, the Qataris are opening bank accounts for the Syrian opposition for them to buy weapons. The Libyans announced today they were giving $100 million to the Syrian opposition. I don't think that's for <laughs> juice and candy. Um, the blocking of the diplomatic path at the UN is actually what is pushing Syria into increasingly war. Is that an argument that has any resonance or uh, understanding in Russia? And what do you think Putin's feelings about Kofi Annan are? Maybe we can collect uh, some questions. I in the yeah, yeah. Maybe we can collect. Okay. okay. We'll take another uh, another question. Mm -hmm. A short comment, second, Richard, and then short comment, and then uh, a question. The comment is related to the question. Uh, I was struck by what you said uh, about Putin's speech uh, five years ago and the article, the contrast. I was there when Putin made that speech, and I have to say, I was struck very much by how personally this was. This was an emotional outburst, basically. And he really had the feeling, what right does the United States have to go around trampling international law, trying to tell us what to do, and so forth. But this came at a time when uh, Russia was still, uh, and under Putin, doing well. What seems to me now, as you said, is the defensive tone. That was offensive but also personal and emotional. Now my question is, if you look at w uh, what uh, Putin inherits today, the situation is very different. I would argue it's a very different Russia than when the, the Russia that he took over. One in which the economic situation is much worse, but also one in which there is this uh, political unrest and an assertive uh, middle class. Do you think he understands the degree to which Russia has changed? Uh, do you think uh, that he would be w uh, willing to make some compromises uh, in order to, as um, to assuage uh, some of the protests? Or do you think it is likely that he will clamp down? And what impact then do you think domestic politics will have on Russian foreign policy? Hi, my name is Chris Thorpe. I'm from Democracy International. As you stated, NGOs in Russia that receive foreign um, funding, such as GOLOs, have been severely criticized by Putin. Um, in your opinion, what effect have these organizations had in Russia among the um, public as well as among the elites, and also what impact, especially if protests continue past the uh, one scheduled for March 5th and 10th, and um, especially if the election is, um, you know, how, how that will be perceived, what impact um, will this have on the way Putin governs? Thank you. Yeah, uh, and Syria, uh, I think that, that, that there is a full understanding uh, in Russian foreign ministry, for example, that uh, Assad regime is doomed to fail. And uh, what I mentioned in before that uh, initially it was part of motivation was commercial, but not, not anymore because it, it's clear that deals with this regime will not be very <laughs> safe. Uh, I think that uh, discussion about what was worse to adopt resolution or to block resolution might be uh, endless and Russian diplomats uh, will, will give <laughs> some arguments uh, in favor of their position and you will give uh, different arguments. My view as, as an outsider is that 
by the time the resolution was proposed and the draft was put in the Security Council, it was gone. So the civil war in Syria started before, before and the, the diplomatic solution was possible maybe half a year ago, but not, not, not anymore. Uh, conceptual difference is that Russia sees what is happening in Syria uh, as a, again, as a civil war with heavy international intervention already now in form of Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and other Arab Gulf uh, states on the one side, Iran on the other side. Uh, and the question, and, and it's quite, quite clear what, what is happening. This, this geopolitical standoff between Saudi Arabia and Iran on the one hand, and uh, religious sectarian uh, controversy between Shia and Su Sunni on the other hand. And the question is, why should international community uh, be engaged on, on one side in this war? Why, why this side? Why we think that this side is, is, is better than the, the, the other? And this is, this is a conceptual, conceptual difference to, uh, to the West and to Arab world. I think Arab countries have their own agenda and the Arab League is uh, driven by two, three countries with completely very clear interests. As for uh, Western picture, uh, Russians uh, simply don't buy this uh, perception as a peaceful, uh, freedom and democracy loving uh, uh, people against a uh, bloody tyrant. So it's much more complicated and now, especially now, it's, 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 it doesn't matter who, who wins. It will be a complete mess in, in Syria. I'm afraid that the, the worst thing which will happen, and nobody, nobody discusses it yet, what will happen to minorities? Because the situation for Alawites, for uh, Christians, for Armenians, for Kurds in the post-Assad Syria will be awful. And of course, Saudi Arabia and Qatar will not care about that at all. But for the West, it will be quite a big problem to see how Christians, for example, will be slaughtered in, in, in Syria. And I think that should be discussed now. And here, I ho hope that Russia could play a role. But unfortunately, uh, instead of that, we have this, this conceptual difference. Uh, uh, yeah, Kofi Annan, uh, I, I didn't hear anything about, uh, anything uh, substantial about this, this, this mission. Uh, again, my feeling, that I, I'm afraid that this is shared also by, by many people in the Russian establishment, it's, it's too late. It's now to, to any, any special envoy cannot change this situation. Uh, to what extent Putin understands that, that Russia has changed? Uh, he certainly he realizes that something has changed. And uh, at the, the meeting, this four hours meeting with political commentators and scientists early February, uh, he was quite, quite uh, detailed about that. And uh, the feeling, my feeling was that uh, he understands that it's not only Hillary Clinton's money which <laughs> makes people, uh, make people to, to go to the streets. It's something, something else. Uh, he believes sincerely that this is wrong, that those people, maybe sincerely, maybe uh, they are uh, honest people, but they don't understand what they want. And they don't understand that, that Russian statehood is still extremely fragile, and this is too early to implement changes they might demand. Uh, at the same time, you say that, that, that Russia today is much uh, weaker than Russia five years ago when Putin de de delivered his Munich speech. That's true. Uh, more, difficult. more difficult, yeah, absolutely. But at the same time, which country since that became less difficult? That's, that's the total mess everywhere. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, but, but this, is, this is a gradual degradation of everything, and Russia is part of that. 
Uh, I would not overestimate yet, at least, the scale of protests, because uh, we are a little bit fascinated by those couple of gatherings in Moscow, which were very impressive, really. But Russia is not only Moscow. And if you look at, at, at the whole country, uh, I'm afraid that quite, quite a lot of people, they are terribly angry about those who come to protest in Moscow because they see that those guys are very, actually very well, well-being, wealthy persons. And th this, is not, this is a middle class, or how to call it, the creative class. It's now many, many names for that. Uh, who actually wants to, want to live even better than they live now? And compared to how many people in other places uh, uh, do, uh, they, they, are very, they, they are okay. And so uh, there is, a, in my understanding, there is a good opportunity for, uh, for the government if they will be smart, if Putin will be smart and his aides will be smart, uh, to actually to calm down this and to divide this, this movement because movement, it's not a position in, in the normal sense. You cannot say that there is no structure, there are, they have no leaders, they have no, uh, no uh, uh, program, no ideas. There, there is a bunch, a big bunch of angry people, people who want to, to, to to choose presidents in the same way as they choose uh, cars, uh, uh, restaurants, or uh, where to go uh, on vacation. Uh, and they, they have no opportunity to choose president yet. And that's why they are angry. Uh, they want dynamism, they want uh, change, by the, but basically majority of them don't want revolutions. Doesn't want revolutions. Uh, so it is a, 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 a it, it, it's it's quite quite possible quite quite uh, uh, Putin could handle that. Of course, it, it the, 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 your question I I cannot answer because I cannot really understand how deep he understands the, this 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 movement. Uh, initially, after the first uh, first gathering, his reaction was that wrong, with his jokes and uh, the, these embarrassing remarks that uh, it doubled size of the next uh, gathering. It uh, exactly doubled size because people are pissed off by, by what he said about them. But then he, 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 he became more cautious and, and uh, he ran actually real campaign against them, but real campaign, political campaign, as here, as in the United States. Uh, uh, I think that it's still an opportunity for him to, to, to respond to those uh, dissatisfied people. But uh, that, that we will see it very soon, because the crucial moment will be a couple of days after election, with uh, some people who will try to demonstrate, regardless what kind of election we will have, even the cleanest ones, the part of opposition will say that was fal falsified. And reaction of authorities will show in in which mood Putin is. NGOs. Ah, NGOs. Yeah, yeah. NGOs. Th this is this is uh, unfortunately uh, quite a bad uh, um, prospect because uh, Putin is very clear about that. He was clear many times, but this, uh, especially in the in the yesterday in the recent article, uh, he still believes that NGO with foreign funding uh, are more or less agents for foreign governments. And that's his, his deep conviction. And I, I, I'm afraid that after this election, uh, we will have uh, another wave of changed legislation in order to make this foreign funding uh, less efficient or more complicated. Okay. Yeah, Steve. Thanks, Sandy. Uh, Steve Flanagan from CSIS. I wanted to come back to your comment about uh, how missile defense may uh, probably in a negative way define the future of the U.S.-Russian relationship. Uh, ironically, it was an issue that, of course, was seized upon, I think, by the administration as, as a possible game changer and, and uh, for the good, uh, something that could show Russia indeed that not only the, the U.S. and Russia and indeed the U.S. and uh, NATO and Russia could cooperate on, on a, a, a security issue that would show clear benefit to Russia. 
I take your point. Granted, there's your point about there isn't that shared threat assessment about Iran or this, un this concern about Iran. But certainly, there's an understanding of the U.S. concern. Certainly. Russian uh, intelligence and, and, and uh, many analysts know that the scope of the system that NATO envisions up through at least uh, the 2020 period is, can in no way threaten uh, the Russian strategic deterrent. So why choose this issue? I mean, unless, uh, I mean, and maybe your point about are they bandwagoning with, chi bandwagoning with is the plan to bandwagon with China, uh, why choose this issue to try to, to define and, and almost, uh, you know, assure a confrontation with the U.S. and NATO um, uh, rather than to try to explore and wait and see, uh, you know, take more of a wait and see attitude? Uh, it seems as if the Russian uh, intent is to get some kind of ironclad guarantee, another treaty, which again, Russian political analysts know is, is impossible for the Obama administration. It would never happen under a, a, the notion of reborn, reborn, re rebirthing the ABM treaty is out of the question. So uh, I, I guess if you could just elaborate a little bit more on sort of what, what do you, how do you see the calculus in all this uh, uh, in, in terms of why make this such a defining issue and, and almost, you know, to almost ensure kind of a, a breakdown in, in the relations uh, over this issue? Uh, Dan Gibbons, Georgetown University. Um, sir, uh, I, I was wanted to go back a little bit with what you said about the um, uh, the previous incarnation of P Putin and his interest in the uh, sort of the uh, sharing of relation with the United States, uh, uh, which he was somewhat disappointed in not getting. Uh, uh, if you could. It, I wonder if it's possible to identify what sorts of things he might have had in mind uh, that Russia and the United States would be doing on this level of uh, uh, global uh, whatever it is that he had in mind here. If, if you could get a sense of, of, of what kinds of things he might have been thinking about collaborating with on that level. Richard. Richard White's Hudson Institute. I actually, I, uh, I disagree with Steve. I agree with you. I think the missile defense is a, is a really bad idea to try and cooperate on. I think the more we try and force it, the more disruptive our relationship would be. So I want to propose another area where we do actually have a cooperative, uh, a lot of shared interests and relates to the pivot that both countries are going through to Asia, which is Korea. I think that Russia can play a very positive role in helping us deal with North Korea. I mean, it has a lot of interest in promoting economic development uh, for its own reason to link better to Asia. It coincides very much with a lot of U.S. goals, and I wasn't sure if you saw any new opportunities, such as the deal today, to perhaps further cooperation in that area. Thank you. About missile defense, you know, you said uh, up to 2020 there is no threat for, for Russian strategic deterrence, which is true. But 2020 is not a strategic horizon at all. So, and th 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 this is a problem that that uh, American side is saying, yeah, but what, why are why are you so concerned? Why not wait and see until 2020? But 2020, if the current plan will be implemented, which is not not necessarily the case, but if, then next stage will be. Uh, uh, about a different kind of system which, which might uh, pose some problem for Russian strategic deterrence. And of course, to start to protest at that moment will, will be even uh, more senseless than, than, than to protest now. So in this regard, I understand our generals, if we assume, and unfortunately we do, that uh, missile defense is also against Russia, not, not exclusively against Russia, but, but uh, inclusively against Russia, then we, we, we should deal with this issue now, not, not after 2020 when, when the, the basics uh, will be uh, already uh, installed by, by, by American side. So the, the, this is, a, this is a quite, quite a logical approach. Another thing is that uh,
phase is, you know, the, the troops won't go beyond the phase four or the phase of rapid approach. The rest of us know our place. And, I mean, that's, that's sort of the message it seems to be that it's coming out. So it's, it's not even a willingness to, to explore how could you develop at least cooperatively in, in the rest of the way and understand. But that, that, that's a profound problem of uh, total lack of, of trust in strategic affairs. Uh, the whole discussion uh, after Lisbon summit, between Lisbon summit in November and the uh, final uh, statement by uh, Rasmussen in June, I think that uh, it's no, no progress and Russian ideas are unacceptable and so. Uh, it was a very interesting discussion and the, the uh, conclusion was that we, we, we have no uh, I mutually acceptable ideas. So in Russian, Russian generals do not trust uh, uh, NATO, uh, or US rather than NATO. Uh, and they, they uh, of course those ideas about uh, uh, binding guarantees, that, that's another, another part of game, because even if, even if we would have binding guarantees, so what? Uh, any country could withdraw from any treaty and say, sorry, now binding guarantees doesn't matter anymore. Uh, I'm afraid it's, 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 uh, we can discuss technicalities very, very uh, extensively and detailed and maybe even uh, find some kind of first initial approaches to. But since there is a profound uh, mistrust on the Russians, on both sides actually. And we still see each other and those arsenals, they are seen, they, they, they are, there is no other reasons to have such arsenals but to, to have it against each other because otherwise no, no, no need. And this is, that's why I'm, I'm afraid we, we are doomed to fail. Uh, what Putin is saying now, ho uh, fortunately, what he wrote in his article uh, about national security uh, three, two, three weeks ago, uh, he, sa he, he wrote, we have two options, to start to build up, build up our own missile defense or to strengthen our uh, uh, missile and nuclear potential to make miss their missile defense inefficient. And we, we choose second option, which I think is, is, is a great idea because to build up our, our own missile defense would, would mean that Russian budget will collapse. So we, we had this such kind of approach <laughs> 25 years ago and now we know how it ends up. But uh, uh, in, in, in conceptual terms, I'm afraid we, we are stuck with this mutual assured destruction and still no, no ideas at all how to, how to overcome it. Uh, what Putin thought uh, about cooperation with the United States, I think the initial idea was that, uh, first of all, Russia has a strategic sphere where the United States should not be uh, active, maybe involved, but not, not in, 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 in the ways Bush tried to do with NATO enlargement and so. Uh, I think Putin was quite sincere about co counterterrorism, and he shares, um, shared many of views by Bush uh, administration about uh, uh, terrorists, uh, Islamists, and so on. Uh, and in a way, he succeeded with that because after 9-11, American protests about Chechen war uh, decreased significantly. Uh, to what extent Putin uh, could imagine strategic alliance, or, or not strategic, alliance with the United States, I don't know. It's, it, I think that in very limited form because the strategic independence of Russia is, is, is absolutely sacred for him. It's, 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 it's what Russia should have in any, any case. And that's why, for example, Russia could not join NATO because that would mean, imagine that it would be possible. 
but that would mean serious limitation of, of strategic uh, action of, of independence, which which Russia would not would not like to to go in. So uh, the vision of Russian American relationship, if we if we put put aside demagogia about yeah common values and so. Uh, there is non-existing, unfortunately. <laughs> there is not a vision about that. Uh, Korea, I fully agree. Korea is is a very. It might be a very successful uh, uh, case for cooperation. I think that Russian proposals uh, about gas pipeline to uh, North Korea to South Korea. Uh, it's, it's interesting proposal. It's important to discuss. Uh, unfortunately policy conducted by international community under American umbrella since uh, basically mid-90s uh, to stop uh, uh, North Korean nuclear program has failed completely. And so we, we, we need new approaches. And, and Russia, I fully agree, in this particular case, Russia can play very constructive role because uh, Russia is seen in, in, in the area as a neutral power without, without big uh, engagement on one of sides. Uh, and, and interestingly, in, in the article uh, in Mos Moskovsky Novosti, Putin mentioned both North Korea and Iran. And about North Korea, he, he wrote that not nuclear, nuclear capacity of North Korea is unacceptable. While about Iran, he didn't, he didn't write it. Which is strange because North Korea already has nuclear <laughs> capacity, but Iran doesn't. But, but they, I, I fully agree it's, it's one of, of cases when we uh, can work together. Okay, we have time for just a couple more questions. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Lithuanian Embassy. Short uh, question. You mentioned region, regional attitude emerging uh, regional attitude from Russian side. Uh, what would be your uh, prediction concerning uh, Russian policy towards Baltic states in the nearest six years? Thank you. Wayne Mary, American Foreign Policy Council. We haven't really talked about Europe. And yet when Putin was president twice, two terms before, his uh, engagement with Europe was one of the more strikingly successful parts of, his, of Russia's external relationships. Uh, his very good relations uh, with French president, German chancellor, uh, Italian prime minister, even with the British prime minister. Uh, and this was an area in which uh, you, you would have to say that you know, his often stated view that Russia is a European country, and he considers himself a European, was manifest in foreign policy priorities. Now, we all know that Europe is somewhat otherwise engaged uh, at, at the moment, uh, but who isn't? Uh, and yet, could you discuss Europe a little bit in terms of where you see uh, a future Putin presidency? George Mason University. I was wondering if you could elaborate on Putin's discussion of illegal soft power. <laughs> I mean, is it criminal in the way it's conducted and so forth? I'm, you know, who knows? But I'd just like some examples and so forth of that. Thank you. Yeah, uh, illegal soft power is a very new notion. It, it emerged uh, two days ago in this article. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't there before, so I cannot, I cannot uh, uh, say much. I th uh, what, what he means is that he, he, he makes a distinction there in, in this article. He says that we, uh, we welcome or we understand the official lobbyism. It's fine. If, if uh, one, uh, an organization works for interests of another country officially, it's, it's fine. But what, we, what, what he calls in illegal soft power when uh, uh, some foreign structures or institutions uh, uh, give money to local Russian uh, NGOs or organizations and they then uh, implement their agenda rather than than, than Russian one. That's what, what he means. And uh, since he, since he uh, used this notion of illegal, 
that's why I, I suspect, I assume, that it will be some kind of legal actions, that, that the law, will, now it's legal, but the law can be changed. Uh, about Baltic states, I, I, I don't think Baltic states are uh, now in the focus uh, on, on, uh, of Russian foreign policy. Or, or any policy. Uh, Putin in this article mentioned uh, the compatriots, uh, but I would say it's rather, it's rather just routine. He, he, he must say it because they are also voters. <laughs> they, some, some people in, in Latvia, for example, quite, quite many Russians, um, Russian citizens uh, who can vo vote. Uh, basically, I don't see any reasons for, uh, for uh, problems, uh, hopefully, uh, with the Baltic states in years to come. It's a bad relationship, quite a bad relationship with Estonia, uh, but uh, nothing which, which, which could uh, provoke a new wave of uh, uh, active uh, standoff as we had a uh, couple of years ago. Uh, about Europe, uh, yeah, all friends of Vladimir Putin are out. So the Berlusconi was the last one. Unfortunately, he <laughs> also de departed recently, uh, which does not mean that his interest for Europe will, will diminish. He, you are absolutely right. He uh, genuinely, he is a very much pro-European. Pro-European in, 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 in the sense that he, he, he is interested in Europe. He wants Russia to be part of European sphere. He for sure uh, identifies Russia as a European country. And he will try to use the current disarray in, in, in European Union uh, to cut new ties, to, to establish new ties, to find ways how to, uh, by means of uh, commercial alliances, commercial strategic alliances to, to implement his initial idea from his first presidency uh, about uh, a big deal uh, swap uh, between Russia and, 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 and Europe, the uh, asset swap, the Russian uh, mineral resources for European technology. And this idea came up several times during his presidency and even when he was prime minister, he, one of his uh, few speeches on, on foreign affairs was about that, about necessity to, to uh, build a strong new Europe, including Russia. And this is interesting that uh, Medvedev, which, uh, who was seen uh, as a more pro-Western, a more, more pro-European leader, because he was polite, he was smiling, he was constructive, and it was quite, quite a, a pleasant thing to deal with him. But if you took, took put aside this, the, the form, his time as president was maybe the emptiest and the, the absolutely most senseless in relationship with the European Union. Nothing, nothing but declarations. When Putin was president, he, was he tried to get something. He tried to propose. He was emotional. He was negative. But because of, because of interest, Medvedev was absolutely indifferent about Europe. He was, strangely enough, more interested in Asia. And if you even compare geography of his visits, uh, state visits, Asia is prevailing. Unlike Putin, who, who is much more eager to be, to be uh, seen as a European. So I, I think that will be a new attempt to uh, conquer, so to say, to conquer Europe. The question is what will happen there, because looking at uh, the trends in, in the European Union today, I wouldn't be optimistic about their ability to, uh, to look strategically at relationship with anybody, including Russia. Well, Fyodor, that was a remarkable tour d'horizon. <coughs> One maximum show, in show business is to always leave them wanting more. And I apologize for all of you that have questions and comments, and I have about 25 more myself. But I think that uh, time is up, and uh, Fyodor, you have more than overfulfilled the plan. So let me uh, lead the thanks from all of us for your sharing your thoughts and your insights today with all of us here. Thank you.